Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Tanessa, a nurse practitioner with SSM Health St. Anthony's, and today I'm honored to have Dr. Bob, Bobby Verna, Verma, sorry, gosh, I can talk today, um, with us to talk about Alzheimer's. Um, Dr. Verma uh, is a psychiatrist that works with SSM Health St. Anthony's in the metro area. He's certified by the American Board of Psychiatry, or yeah, psychiatry and neurology, and he's part of SSM Health Behavioral Health at um, SSM Health St. Anthony's. Um, he graduated from NSCB Medical College and Hospital and did his residency and internship at Griffin Memorial Hospital. Um, with uh, that said, I'm going to welcome Dr. Verma and he's going to talk to us about Alzheimer's. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Verma, I'm a psychiatrist at SSM Health, and uh, I'm really honored to ask to like talk about this topic. Um, it's, a, it's a very under-talked about topic, especially in the elderly population. There needs to be a lot of education that we need to go through because um, I was just reading today on New York Times, it affects about 6 million Americans every year. And by 2050, it, the numbers are going to double. So, uh, um, as we talk about it, and you guys have any questions, please uh, let us know. I'll, I'll be happy to answer those questions. <laughs> oh, okay. So the first question is, what is Alzheimer's uh, disease? Uh, so it's it's a uh, it's the name for a group of symptoms that we see in uh, people uh, as they get older. It's a progressive idiopathic permanent memory loss. And what that means is that it progresses gradually, and uh, uh, we don't know what causes it. And the memory loss that we see with it, it's permanent. Um, and uh, there's a common misconception that Alzheimer's is a part of normal aging process. It's not. Uh, and to clarify that, as we get start getting older, uh, all of us we start losing brain tissue, and we start having difficult difficulty uh, doing calculations and uh, cognitively. Uh, but with Alzheimer's, we see a sudden decline, and it progresses to the extent where people uh, forget their names, their loved ones, the faces. Um, um, so it's not a normal part of aging process. And uh, at the risk of Alzheimer's increases as we get older, and uh, the, the estimate is about 50% of people uh, over the age of 85, uh, they have some form of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so how do we diagnose it? Uh, there's simple testing that can be done in your primary care's office with a diagnosis. Uh, it's called mini mental status exam. So it's about a 30 uh, question uh, exam where they check for different executive functioning um, and abilities. And based on that, it's a screening tool. So it gives us an idea if there's an onset of memory issues. One of the things that we see a lot, by the time we get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, it usually has progressed um, because as people, we have a tendency to mask our uh, declining memory. And so th th there's an emphasis on uh, early diagnosis because if you can diagnose something early, then we can treat it more effectively. And so it's there are, there are different recommendations, but what I uh, uh, 
I like is about like starting at age of 55. Uh, yearly um, uh, mini mental st status examination with the primary care doctor. So we can, uh, if there's a pattern, we can see like uh, what's going on and because there are other causes of dementia that can also pop up. Um, because most of the time, by the time we diagnose a patient, they already have at least like uh, five to 10 years of memory loss before they get diagnosed. So we kind of lose that valuable time there. Uh, there's also a neuropsychologist who can do neuropsychological testing and give us more definitive uh, evaluation of a person's mental status and cognition. Uh, we also do some lab testing because uh, certain vitamins, their deficiencies can cause memory issues as well. So like vitamin B12, uh, folic acid, also uh, diseases of thyroid gland can also cause memory issues. So uh, that's part of the testing. And most common scans that we use for to scan the brain are CT scan or CAT scan of the brain, MRI, and in rare cases, we do PET scan. PET scan is not covered by the insurance company, so it's harder to do. Um, and so based on these test, uh, tests, then we um, look for, uh, uh, kind of connect the labs and scans and testing with the clinical symptoms that we see. So most commonly we see like slowly people start having difficulty remembering the short-term information, the information they learned a day before. Um, so they may not remember what they did a, a night before. Uh, they get confused very easily. Um, we start seeing uh, they wander out of their house because they heard a noise and they get up from the bed and try to see like what's going on and by the time they start doing that they forget what they were set out to do and they sometimes get lost in their neighborhoods or in the small towns. A lot of time uh, patients will get lost or can get confused uh, driving in the evenings because uh, we see a phenomenon of uh, what they used to call sundowning. As the day progresses, the cognition decreases, and they have difficulty at night because it's difficult to look for our familiar landmarks. So a lot of times we, we see patients who come to the hospital because they were lost and police, they didn't know who they were and police, they they bring them to the ER or the hospital so we can see what's going on with them. And uh, confusion during the afternoon into the night, that's what the sundowning we are talking about. As the disease progresses, we see worsening of the neurologic symptoms. Uh, the way we understand that as the different areas of brain get affected, and uh, we start losing those functions. So we start seeing like difficulty sleeping, feeding, uh, and later on it becomes like uh, difficulty walking. They start having falls. Sometimes we also see patients would hallucinate where they're seeing um, objects or people or animals in their rooms or uh, in their homes who are not there. And with them, like, it induces intense amount of anxiety for them because their reality testing is decreased. So they cannot tell like what is real, what is not. And sometimes they get paranoid, thinking their husband or wife is trying to kill them, or poisoning their food, or stealing from them. So it, it kind of creates a very complicated picture. And uh, one of the things we see with that, like um, when they're living with the loved ones, these ish symptoms uh, cause a lot of uh, difficulty in relationships uh, because the paranoia, sometimes loved ones get accused for, of having an affair 
or stealing from them, which can be very hurtful. And so caregivers, they have to understand that, that this is just part of the disease process. They're really not trying to be hurtful by any means. Um, how then after we diagnose and relate the symptoms, clinical symptoms with the, the investigation of through labs and uh, scanning, then how do we manage this? So there are very limited medications that are available to treat Alzheimer's. Um, there's a lot of research that go that's going on, um, but for various reasons, it's it's difficult to uh, have new medications. There are about like four medications that are out there and three of those from, are from the same class. Um, and these medications, they do not reverse the process. Only benefit we have with those, they may stabilize the process or uh, slow down the decline. And that's why it's important to have an early diagnosis uh, um, and uh, then start taking medications early on so we know what's going on and we can chart the progress and see like what we need to plan for. Um, anything that's good for brain, it's good for your heart and good for your body. And that couple of things that kind of I'll talk about is smoking cessation. Smoking increases risk of uh, having cardiovascular events like a stroke. Um, and a stroke can also cause memory problems. So um, uh, cutting down smoking or stop smoking, th those are really beneficial for people. Uh, having a balanced diet and uh, they're all different kind of diets that have been tried and people promote from time to time. Um, but just having like a balanced diet where you're getting adequate amount of protein, um, fiber, healthy fats, and uh, uh, carbohydrate with micronutrients, that's, that's where we want it to be, you know. And then we talked about medications. Um, some of the important things from my point of view, because I work in the hospital and see a lot of patients who come in after the disease has progressed, uh, where they have a really difficult time managing their affairs. And so some of the things is long-term care planning. Like think about like what would you like to do if and when you may have to go to a memory care or a nursing facility. Let your loved ones know what your preferences are because it's usually your children or other family member who are making these decisions and it's very difficult for them to decide if they don't know what you would have preferred. Um, one of the big things that I've been seeing a lot lately is uh, elder abuse. Uh, and what I mean by that is a lot of people, they victimize elderly uh, for the financial gain or uh, other gains. And uh, with memory problems, it becomes a difficult issue because I've known patients who lost all their retirement savings in hundreds of thousands of dollars through these scams. And it, it just destroys their life because they lose that valuable money to pay for their care as they get older. So that's something family members have to think about, like to work with the bank or work with the, with the loved ones and have a plan. So if something, some kind of activity like that happens, they can do something very quickly before it gets too big. Uh, one way uh, that has been shown to decrease uh, progression and onset of Alzheimer's is learning new activities. Um, learning new activities engages new, engages and creates new neural pathways in the brain. And so learning new language, learning new skill, um, 
learning new art it's it's beneficial um, to engage different parts of the brain exercise also has shown to improve um, quality of life and slow the progression of the of the disease um, and there are a lot of resources that are available on internet but I would like people to go to reliable resources that are vetted and have information that's scientifically proven and uh, checked by physicians and nurses uh, and the caregivers. One of the big resources, Alzheimer's Association, um, very, very useful. Uh, it's alz.org. Always talk to your primary care physicians and see if uh, get more information. Um, National Institute of Health has really good resource uh, library where in different languages uh, they have a Spanish, English, where the, the loved ones can understand what the process is, what's going on. Uh, with their loved ones because a lot of time they get confused. They think that the mother uh, Grandparents they're just acting but you no know, they are just going through like this progressive neurologic disorder um, A lot of different things I can keep talking about but we have a limited time So thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity and Anytime you have guys have questions, direct those to me. Yes, um, you mentioned that Alzheimer's disease is a more deliberate disorder. Um, something that I wanted to ask is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Sure. So, dementia, uh, it's, it's a permanent loss of memory. That's what we describe as dementia and dementia can be caused by a lot of different uh, disease processes like uh, somebody can have a stroke and that can affect their memory uh, substance use disorders like alcohol use can cause dementia vitamin deficiencies can cause mem permanent memory problems uh, and Alzheimer's is a dis uh, diagnosis of exclusion when we exclude all different causes that can cause dementia and we don't find any of those causes that's when we diagnose somebody with alzheimer's and the only way to confirm is, is through the brain biopsy Right. Um, so like any kind of toxins that we get exposed in environments, some people like they've worked on um, jet engines for all their lives, so things, fumes, um, any kind of hydrocarbon that can cause as well, so kind of avoiding those. Um, Sure. So there are two different categories of medications. One is called uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and there are three different medications. And um, two of those we use very extensively because they're very well tolerated. Um, one I'm, I'm going to use commercial name if that's okay. <laughs> one is okay. One is called uh, Axelon, and it. it it, it comes in oral uh, preparation and also a patch that you can use on a daily basis. Um, the advantage, advantage with the patch is uh, we don't have systemic side effects because some of these medications can cause uh, um, nausea or vomiting. And the second one that's more popular uh, has a lot of research behind it is called Aricept. Uh, very well tolerated medication 
And with most of these medications, we usually start at low dose and kind of slowly increase the dose to uh, and to increase the efficacy. And we're basically looking for the side effects and things like that. And then we have uh, Nemanda, which is a separate class, and we use it for moderate to severe, where people having a lot of uh, other symptoms. It's the way we understand it decreases the toxicity of the brain tissue. Um, so uh, most commonly we notice like usually in the evenings people will have difficulty remembering names or what they're having for dinner um, the reason is like by the evening time we our brain buffers are running low so any kind of stress will kind of show up as uh, um, and we'll use up those resources and we'll start seeing these issues where they cannot remember somebody's name. And uh, in older days, we used to remember a lot of phone numbers, but we don't do that anymore. <laughs> you know. Thank you very much. And now Lynette, uh, she's with SSM Health as well. She will provide some resources. Hi, I'm Lynette Long and I'm a business development consultant for behavioral health for uh, SSM Health. And I just wanted to talk to you about uh, some of the resources that we can offer um, to you. We have what we call a, the Geriatric Diagnostic Center at uh, SSM Health. It's actually located at our south location at 2129 Southwest 59th Street. Um, it, the Geriatric Diagnostic Center is actually, it offers comprehensive mental health diagnosis and treatment for senior adults so that they can really live um, a fuller life with a greater independence. So our specialized services there at that camper, at campus offer a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, using a psychiatrist, we have licensed clinical social workers, uh, certified recreational therapists, um, program manager, uh, registered nurses, and behavioral health techs. Um, the individualized treatment plans are formulated there and implemented by this team to help ensure that all the mental health and behavioral health issues are uh, taken care of and addressed based upon the patient's current level of functioning. So senior adults really often display symptoms that can indicate emotional, psychiatric, behavioral, or stress-related problems. And the cause of these problems can either be medical or psychological in nature, or sometimes it's both. Um, so once these things were considered normal signs of aging, and many mental health problems are actually symptom symptoms of treatable conditions. So with proper diagnosis and treatment, there can be really remarkable improvements in a senior's quality of life and their relationships with friends and family. Um, the Geriatric Diagnostic Center is hospital-based, and um, we do offer a full range of support services as well. Um, with medical diagnostic capability, um, internal medicine specialists, and we even have um, the ability to do electric convulsive um, therapy, which can be offered as a treatment modality when um, we have those people that have severe treatment resistive depression and when medications haven't really worked very well for them. Um, we also have a uh, treatment programs that are not on the inpatient side of the equation. There's a level of care actually between inpatient and outpatient, and it's called intensive outpatient or partial, partial hospitalization programs. And so Dr. Bobby Verma also does those for us as well. Now, um, those programs run Monday through Friday, and they will vary based upon the intensity, frequency, and duration of treatment based upon um, the individual's patient needs and those programs are really designed to help those dealing with depression, anxiety, grief, 
anger, panic attacks, trauma, just any type of poor overall mental health functioning. So the goal of those programs is to really offer support and treatment to help prevent inpatient hospitalization if possible for mental health issues. Um, therapeutic services of that type enable the patient the opportunity to continue to remain at home in the evening time and have their treatment during the day. The programs really can also be utilized after an inpatient stay to provide continued stabilization and support uh, to be able to reintegrate the patient back into their community and their routine. So we are covered by most insurance, commercial insurances and Medicare. Um, and for more information about any of our adult programs uh, on the intensive outpatient side of the equation or partial hospitalization, you can call 405-772-4690. And um, you can speak with Allie. She's really wonderful. She can help you out with all your needs in regards to if you need a referral to one of those programs. Um, we do have two locations for intensive outpatient partial hospitalization. One is at 416 West 15th Street in Edmond. That's in the Signal Ridge uh, Center. And then we have the South Oklahoma City location at 2129 Southwest 59th and Penn. Um, if you would like more information about our services in general at SSM, you can call 405-713. 5706 and they can uh, we can actually even do virtual assessments now um, to see what if you don't know what level of care that you're in need of uh, we can do virtual assessments and that's also you can call the 713-5706 number and we can do virtual assessments for you to to get you linked in with the right service so yeah. we thank you for having us today Thanks again, um, Dr. Bobby Verma and Lynette Long with SSM Health Behavioral Health Center. Um, learned a lot from that today. I know a few of you probably couldn't hear some of the questions that were being asked off screen. Um, in particular, we uh, kind of covered uh, the specific meds to slow progression, some prevention activities, um, risk factors, and um, let's see, was there anything else that we do what? Oh, the, the medications in particular, yeah. Uh, the medications in particular, Dr. Verma went over those as well. If you have any further questions, please uh, don't hesitate to submit them and I'm happy to cover um, anything with Dr. Verma or Lynette and get back to you on that. Um, you guys have a, a great rest of your day and a happy upcoming Thanksgiving. <laughs>